a few minutes ago, and for some reason my computer crashed. So this is the un unclean version of it. So it's still not worthy and it's still not. But anyway, inshallah, whatever we can go through, we'll try to go through with today. Uh, we carry on with uh, where we left off just uh, last week. The next disease is called Van. Van in Arabic, in English, negative thoughts. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has specifically mentioned this many a time in Quran, and it is imperative that we understand the context in which this is applied. So the first is having a bad opinion about others. Baseless assumptions, suspicions, etc. This is what is termed as one or negative thoughts in Islam. Because this, this, gives, this gives rise to conjecture, which is to say or think about somebody or even act upon something that a person does not have facts about. So it's not premised on any uh, substantial uh, fact, but rather on a person's thoughts. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned in Surah al hazra again and again, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu ijtanibu kathiran min al-dhan. Avoid suspicion. Why? Fa'inna ba'd al-dhan ithm. Some suspicion is actually sinful. So having bad and a bad opinion that is baseless is actually a sin. And this sin then leads to riba, which is backbiting. So a person thinks something and or suspects something, and just on the basis of mere suspicion, a person then goes on to broadcast what a person has thought he or she has seen. And this obviously will lead to riba and even to something worse than that, which is buhtan. Buhtan meaning to slander somebody. So on a mere basis of suspicion, then it spreads like wildfire, and a person's character is assassinated. A, person's, a person who is innocent, really, he or she may be totally innocent, and we go about spreading false rumors. This is an extremely, extremely sinful uh, and this is an extremely sinful activity. Nabi of Allah has said that in hadith. He has mentioned that this is the most false form of speech. Just to go and say something or do something based on a person's suspicions. So the first thing is, and this is very, very important in our time, because when we receive a text, when we receive a WhatsApp, when we receive a message. And then without, without any proof, without even knowing the facts, we just spread it onto our, our, our messages and our contacts. And this can fall in this, this category, which is sinful. So we have to verify. So ask for proof. The first thing is proof. Verify it. And without verifying anything, a person goes on to spread it. This is tantamount to a lie. This is tantamount to lying. And Nabi Abdullah has said this is a sin. So Imam Mawlud says that look, obviously to bring it into perspective, that there are certain times, for example, somebody wants to marry somebody else. And somebody comes to you and asks for an opinion about a person's character. Right? Then a person must, if there are true facts, remember, these are true. Facts that are true. So unfortunately, we say facts that are true. Those facts should always be true. But anyway, when there are facts and there is observable evidence and it's based on reason, etc., then you can say, okay, for a, for a just reason, for a just cause, to say, okay, this person has this character flaw, or this person has this character flaw, then this won't be one, obviously, and this is allowed in Islam. Similarly, for example, in the science of hadith, when the narrators were scrutinized, and then people would, would, would uh, look at the narrators of the chain of narration and they say that this person had a very bad character, he was a liar, or he, he used to fabricate things. And this was called jarh. So they would sort of wound the character of this person 
but because of a valid reason. So without these reasons, then uh, of, even if it is an observable fact that a person is doing wrong, we should not really be telling anybody about it. And if it is not an observable fact, then by all, by, by definitely by all means, a person should not at all engage in this activity. <coughs> so, <coughs> then the final hadith, Nabi of Allah salatu wasalam, said very beautifully that there are two things that no believer has been given uh, anything better. Number one is a good dhan, a good opinion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In other words, we should always think uh, positive thoughts with regard to Allah. In other words, Allah is most forgiving when I am sick. Allah will give me a cure. These sort of positive uh, thoughts are actually encouraged. Nabi of Allah has said that always think good things, have a good opinion about Allah. Allah will treat you reciprocatively. Allah will treat you in a good way. And the second thing is to have a good opinion about the servants of Allah. Subhanahu wa <coughs> Remember, people are always innocent until they are proven guilty. And this is very, 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 very sadly, a very uh, sad situation in our Ummah is that without just cause, without any sort of verification, then we go on telling and spreading rumor after rumor, and this spreads like wildfire. So then a person does not know whether it's true, whether it is false, and it is a sign of Qiyam actually. We have a I said, towards the end of time, a person who is truthful will not be believed, and a person who is a liar, he, that person then will become believed. So really this is something, especially in today's social media, we saw something, we heard something, it is not allowed upon us to carry on spreading that without proof, without verification. So, this is with regard to evil thoughts, and this is the next disease that the Imam has mentioned. Are there any questions with regard to this? Okay, inshallah, we'll carry on to the next one. This is called vanity. Oh, Imam al-Ghazali has said there are two very closely linked diseases. One is kibr and the other is uj. Kibr is haughtiness, pride, and uj is vanity. Now the difference between the two, very, very interestingly Imam Ghazali says that the arrogant person needs two people. One is the person himself to be arrogant and to show that arrogance upon somebody. But a person who is vain just needs himself or herself. Because it's all about showing, being impressed with himself or his status or her status, his talents, possessions, looks, status, etc. And this is a very vain person. Vanity is obviously not a good, it's not a good character trait for a person to have because a person rejoices, very beautifully mentioned by the Imam, a person rejoices in the blessings but he forgets the source of the blessings. So whatever Allah has granted us, whatever great talents Allah has given us, yes, we should use it in the best means for the best possible benefit, but we should not become vain with regard to it. So the next point the Imam has mentioned, that you must remember at the end of it, whatever we do have is still a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is the source all our talents, all our potentials. If we are thankful, Allah will increase that. If we are vain and we attribute it to our own self, like how Qarun did. Qarun was told by Musa alayhi salam that, O oh, oh Qarun, give from the wealth that Allah has given you. So he said, what? The wealth Allah has given me? What are you talking about? This is because of my education. This is because of my prowess in the, in the economic field. I was a, such a great investor. It was my thinking. And because of that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it such that he was swallow, swallowed by the earth because of his vanity and his pride. So this is a disease. And very interestingly, it, the, the word vanity the Imam mentions comes from the, the Latin word. And that means just empty. Which means that a person who the source of our vanity is really void of substance and will soon vanish. So remember that, inshallah. And this is the next um, disease that the Imam spoke about. Okay, are there any questions with regard to this? How do you balance it? Like, say, you mean, you can't, there's no 
That's a very good question. We have Allah when he mentioned about kibr, about pride, he was asked this very same question that a person loves to be clean, a person loves a nice car, a person loves a nice house. Is that also part of being vain or part of being proud? We have Allah said, In Allah Jameel, Yuhibbul Jamal. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself is beautiful and he loves things that are beautiful. So for a person to be hygienic, to be clean, to look good, to smell good, you know, to, to try to present themselves well, good appearances, that is fine. But always attributing the source to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why when we look in the mirror, what do we say? Alhamdulillah, Allahumma kama hassanta khalqi fa hassin khuluqi. Allah, just like you have beautified my external, beautify my internal. Meaning, Allah is the one who beautified my external, but I'm not, I'm not, uh, only looking at skin deep, but I'm going within, and Allah beautify me internally also. So number one, recognize that it is a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and number two, respond appropriately in using that gift for a good and beneficial cause, and as we said, always attributing it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there's no problem in keeping up good appearances, in being clean, being hygienic, I mean obviously that goes without saying, but always attributing it and then also there's, there's another, there's a fine line also between looking good, ni wanting nice things, and extravagance. Because extravagance again is, is another extreme. And extravagance is not looked upon very favorably in Sharia. A person is encouraged to be simple, a person is encouraged to live within their means, and a person is encouraged to take good use of the, 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 the beauty that Allah has created, but within reason and within means, and not to be extreme. So it's always that equilibrium, not going on one extreme of completely excessiveness, and neither the other extreme of being completely deficient. And that is what it is. Are there any other questions with regard to that? Okay. So, <clears throat> the cure for vanity, two things. This is stems from two things. Allah is the one who has fashioned and created and given us. And number, number two, we must remember that it is only with Allah's help that we are able to accomplish anything. Without the help of Allah, there is nothing we can accomplish. And even though we may have the means, but without Allah saying so, we are not able to do so. And if we think, you know, this is something that uh, is not possible, just go down the road, Oxford Road, and go into the hospital, those who had absolutely nothing wrong with them. Allah, so Allah save us, completely paralyzed at one, cannot even, cannot even put their finger up. They had everything perfect. You know? So we count our blessings, thank Allah greatly, you know, and it is only Allah. Even that's why in the shahud, you know, some of the ulama say, you know, the wisdom of saying, Ashhadu an la ilaha you know, we raise our finger. Now, there are many wisdom, there, there's a lot of hikmah behind it. And one is that when we are thinking of Allah, we're saying, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. That our Allah, we truly do not have the ability to raise even one finger if you did not give us the, the capacity to do so. And trust me, my dear brothers and sisters, this is so true. <clears throat> and remember, if we do not humble ourselves, we will be humbled. This is, this is the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That those who are not humble within themselves will be soon humbled, and, and, and sometimes in not a very nice way. How do we get rid of this? Number one, again, reflect long and hard on the fact that all blessings are entirely from Allah and that we cannot produce any benefit or harm without His permission. So this is basically with regard to vanity. Um, let us carry on. The next disease, we are going quickly because there are, there's very uh, little time left and we try to finish as much as we can, at least even just the headings so that at the back of our mind somewhere we will know that these are things that we should really become aware of and safeguard ourselves from. Anyway, the next disease that the Imam mentions is called Ghish. Ghish, in Arabic, in, in, in English we, we say fraud. What does it mean? 
it is concealing from people some fault, blemish or harm, either of a religious or worldly nature. This is very, very obvious when, when we're selling something. For example, if we got, you know, we're selling something on eBay or something, and then we, 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 we praise that object to the high heavens and, and, and uh, not tell the person, the prospective buyer, of any defects, this is actually full, according to Nabi Allah alayhi salatu wasalam. Allah's Nabi alayhi salatu wasalam had told us to be actually very, very honest. And he said that when a person is selling something, a person must tell the buyer that this is a fault in that object. Without it, Nabi Allah alayhi salatu wasalam has said this is actually rish. And then he said, man ghashana falaysa minna. That person who tries to fraud or defraud somebody is definitely not one of us. So that's why you can see concealing defects, failing to disclose them intentionally. Of course, if you didn't know yourself that there was a defect and you sold it on to somebody, I mean, you didn't know, you didn't know. But if you knew and you tried to paper it, you know, then this is actually fraud. And remember, if we, if we, if we get any sort of income from there, how can there be barakah? How can there be any sort of blessing from Allah with regard to that? I mean, this is very, very important. And then the Imam very beautifully talked, talked about one is fraud over what we understand and the other is fraud of the tongue, as he mentioned. And that's why sometimes you will hear that politicians are told that th what you are saying is just sophistry. Maybe you've heard that, sophistry. It comes from the sophists, the ancient Greeks. But they wouldn't worry about what is true or what is false. All they worry about who is more convincing in their argument. So if the liar was more convincing, they'd accept it. And the truthful person was not more convincing, then they, they do not accept it. So this is called sophistry. This is being a sophist. And this is actually fraud of the tongue. Nabi of Allah has said that sometimes you people come to me with arguments. And one of you is more eloquent than the other. So the one who is more eloquent fights his case very well. But all the time that person is, is, is not truthful about his or her claim. And even they come to the Prophet of Allah. And because of the, the glib, the glib nature of the tongue, they so, you know, some people you can, <laughs> when you talk to them, you feel they're so slippery that you feel they're just trying to scam you. <laughs> even if they're completely normal. You know, that's how, they are so slippery. So Nabi of Allah is warned that you may come to me as the Prophet of Allah. I may not pick it up because you are so good with your tongue. But remember, if you took another person's thing by just being so very slippery and smooth talking with your tongue, then this is actually fraud of the tongue. And we may win in this world, but in the sight of Allah we will not. So very, what, we, what basically we are told to be is to be honest. That is what it is. Because the opposite of fraud is to be honest. And that will, whether it's honesty with regard to talking, acting, anything, thoughts, Whatever anything, this is what we are told in Islam. So a person may be very good at rhetoric, very eloquent, but true uh, honesty is with regard to being uh, a true, the true virtue is with being, being honest. Are there any questions with regard to this? So you mentioned for in terms of um, like where we get some stuff like that, or about religious work for the army. Religious work? Yeah, as you said on the what does it say? Second it is concerning from people some fault blemish or either of a religious or worldly nature. I suppose what it might mean that the Imam is mentioning that a person outwardly to try and fleece other people presents himself or herself in a very in the religious garb and adopts the ways of religious people. You know, and this is this is also the quacks. Huh? That outwardly, outwardly, very, very religious or religiously looking, but the whole idea is how to fleece people over their money. And this is, do you know where we see this a lot? Have you heard of Tawis? Have you heard of those who have medical cures and those who have cures for jadu? And and they can ask you, okay, if you come to me, I've got three types of Tawis. One is for 20 pounds, one is for 200 pounds, and one 2,000 pounds. 2,000 pounds is very fast acting, 20 seconds and all your problems are gone. 
this is religious fraud. Using the name of Allah, using the name of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam to try to defraud, you know, defraud simple people from their money, this is really, really bad. So these are the fake, you know, uh, uh, people who are out not only to steal our our money but also to steal our iman. So we must be very, very careful. So I would suspect whether it is of a religious or worldly nature. Okay, are there any other questions with regard to that? The next, the next is a very, very common disease. And this is a disease that we really need to look really deeply within ourselves. Nabi Allah has mentioned this many, many times in the world. In Arabic we say Ghadab. In English we say Khanda. Imam Qawlud has mentioned that this disease is like a, this, like a swelling ocean. It's like a raging, swelling ocean. And it is indeed a true, amazingly true phenomenon. <coughs> Once a person came to Nabi Allah and he said, Oh sing. Oh, sir, give me advice. Let me just said to him, La Tabla, do not become him. He came again, asked again, Oh, sir, Ya Rasulullah. Nabi again said, La Tabla. Third time again, he came to Nabi of Allah, he said, Oh, sir, oh, sir, give me some advice, Wasiya. Nabi of Allah again said, La Tabla. And this is so, so, so important. I know working in the community, working with our people, I mean, how many a time have we not seen a uh, person will come to us, phone us, middle of the night, what happened? I divorced my wife. Three divorces one time. Why did you do it? I was angry. <laughs> this anger, Allah Akbar, my dear brothers, is, is so dangerous if it's not controlled. Anger is a terrible, terrible thing. A person, because of not being able to control a person's anger, a person breaks his or her marriage, a person destroys the future of their children, innocent children, a person says or does something, Allah forbid, goes to the extent of taking somebody else's life. Why? Because of anger, in a fit of rage. How many a time have we not seen that the statement, why did you do it? Oh, just a fit of rage. So it's extremely, extremely important, my young friends, that from now we are able to control this anger within us. Anger in itself it can be used for good causes, remember? It is an innate, natural quality occurring naturally within us for a reason. Huh? Nabi of Allah himself became angry, like we are saying here. Yeah. I am human being, and I, be, I do become angry because it is part of our human nature. And sometimes he becomes so angry that his whole face would go red. But, remember again, this is what is the difference between good anger and bad anger. The sinful, the virtuous type of anger is when there was something wrong. Somebody did something that was offensive. Something with regard to the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Remember, well, dunya, he never became angry. Nabi of Allah never became angry with regard to the things of this dunya. But when something happened with regard to deen, then, a, then he displayed anger. Similarly, a person does not have the ability to be angry. So if a person is walking down the street, you know, and somebody does something to his family, if he does not have the quality of anger, he won't be able to defend himself or herself. So that's why anger, as we will see the, 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 the saying of Imam Ghazali, if it's the right place, the right time, the right reasons, and the right intensity, then it's okay. Four things. The right time, time. there's the right time for being angry. <laughs> there's the right place for being angry. And there must be the right reason for being angry. And then also to the right intensity. So what you did a small little thing, you don't become so angry now. You know? No, that's not the way. So remember it in this way. Use it like trip. You know? Time, reason. What else do I say? What you say is that? Intensity. Intensity. Trip. I remember that, but I didn't remember. <coughs> Okay, so anyway, Nabi of Allah has, 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 has mentioned this. Carrying on, <coughs> now this is very beautiful. Before we go on to this, um, are there any questions with regard to anger? We'll come to the treatment of that later on. 
Okay, let us go to the next. This is a very, this is a very nice topic that uh, the Imam has mentioned here. All this we have been studying over the last how many nine weeks or so. The ulama have mentioned that there are four essential qualities, four innate faculties within each and every one of us, and these in English are called the cardinal virtues. In Arabic we call Ummahatul Ummahatul Fadail. That will come in the next term. <coughs> now all the Imams like Al Ghazali Rahimahullah, Al Razi, Radib, Al Asfahani, and all others who, are, who deal with morality and ethics have mentioned this again and again. So they say there are four main qualities that each and every person has. The first is called Quwwatul Ilm. The second is called Quwwatul Ghadab, Quwwatul Shahwa, and Quwwatul Adl. And this is also in, in Western traditions also well known. The first, Quwwatul Ilm, is with regard to what is mentioned in, in, in English as the rational soul. The ability Allah has given us to be rational about things. See, our brain also is, is, is three parts to the brain. You know? and that will also come later on. But the first is with regard to being able to, to, to rational, rationalize, to learn, etc. The second qawwa, the second faculty or quality that Allah has given each and every one of us, is what is called the irascible, meaning the, the emotive side of us. Anger. This way it comes from Quwwatul Ghadab The capacity that relates to emotions and anger So the emotional part of us, the rational part of us The third, the third part, the concupiscent What it really means is desire Where a person has this, this power of desire This faculty of desire and appetite and then the fourth part, to bring all three of it together and harmonize the three previous powers, is called Quwwatul Adl. Adl means justice, fairness. And this brings all these three things to uh, the, the desired part. Now each of these three, uh, each of these four faculties are very interesting to study. Because there are three situations to each of these three. In the first, Quwwatul Ilm, there are, like in all the others, there are three situations. Either it is excessive, and a person is excessively clever, and that person is no, normally a, a person will use it to exploit and scam people because it's too clever for other people. So he will use that power and he will use it for exploitation. Similarly, if it's in deficiency, then it's a poor person and everybody takes. Okay, everybody, you know, uh, takes undue advantage of that person. So, if it's in excessive, it's not good. If it's in uh, deficiency, then also it's not good. The best, uh, the, the best uh, stage is when it's in moderation. So, in all three, in all four, they are either it will be found in each and every one of us. We see that all these qualities that we definitely do have. Which stage is it? And the best, and the, what we should try to aspire to, is the middle stage, the stage of moderation, bringing into balance. So not overdoing it, not underdoing it, especially ghadab also, to become extremely angry, I mean, no, not anger, no, a person is so, so cold, you know, another person is very hot, no, a person should be moderate. Similarly, shahwa, a person has too much shahwa, a person has too less shahwa, even that's not good, and moderation. So, these are the four faculties that uh, the, the great Imams have mentioned, are really what we have been all studying, and from all these uh, four faculty, faculties, do all, all morality stems from here, all good virtues stem from here, all evils is, is, is when these are in either excess or either in uh, deficiency. So these are called the cardinal virtues, like I mentioned in, 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 in Arabic we say Ummahatul Fadha'il. And remember, when they are in its moderation, in its balance, then Quwwatul Ilm manifests itself when through wisdom. 
So when a person is excessively clever and uses it for exploitation, that's not good. When a person is not very clever at all and really takes undue advantage is taken of him or her, and the, the moderate stage is what we call wisdom, hikmah. And this is what we need to aspire to achieve, wisdom, hikmah. The second one, what we call, um, with regard to, what is the second one? I had a long day, sorry. Although, if it, in, if it is in its excessive form, then this person will be a bully. A person who is always taking advantage of another person. When it is in its deficient form, this person is a coward. I think, uh, really, this person just flees at everything. And when it is in its equilibrium, the moderate state is called shaja'ah, which is called courage. And this is what we need to aspire. Control the two stages and come to the middle stage. Then the next, the next qawwa, which is shahwa, desire, then if it is in excessive, then this will lead a person to a lustful life, hedonistic, materialistic life. If it is in deficiency, this person is really not good for, for, for anything really, and is extremely cold person. So how the person needs to bring it within what is called iffa or temperance, and not too high, neither too low. And then the last one is called adl, and that is justice. So these four are called the cardinal virtues, and all virtues emanate from these virtues. And that's what they call the matrices of virtue. For example, mercy is an offshoot of wisdom, because a person understands with regard to mercy that this is the way, the best way forward in a certain situation. So just show the person using his forward to live in, in a way that it should be used. Okay, so far any questions so far with regard to these four faculties and understanding it? Okay. <clears throat> and this is what I'll be explaining. And the the real the real aim of all this we've been learning over the last nine weeks or so, my dear brothers and sisters, is to try to learn this. How to be balanced individuals. All this we have been learning about uh, are intrinsic in our nature. They are in our nature. All these and if we do not use them correctly, then they manifest themselves in all these uh, evil qualities. When we use them correctly, these same, these same faculties that Allah has given us, these same desires, these same abilities Allah has given us, then they manifest themselves, if we use it in the right way, in all the virtues. And that is how to get that balance. So when the rational soul is balanced, this will result in wisdom. When it is excessive, then it's trickery and exploitation. And courage is the mean between a person who is uh, impetuous and a person who is a coward. And temperance, like I mentioned, is the balance between uh, when a person reaches the balance of not having excessive desire and not having also deficient desire. So this is what we are talking about and this is what we really need to aspire towards because it is very very easy it is very easy to be from one extreme to the other extreme but the difficult the difficulty is being balanced being moderate at all times now this is very interesting <clears throat> because we draw from our rich heritage remember my dear brothers and sisters what our muslim philosophers our Muslim thinkers were talking about centuries ago. Imam Ghazali was in the 5th century. Huh? Razi, etc. were 5th, 6th century. That's almost a thousand years ago. And if we look at modern research, this is exactly what they are telling us. See, as Muslims, we must remember we have a glorious heritage. And so if we, if we analyze it with regard to what, what uh, neurologists tell us about the brain, then the brain is triune, meaning three parts. There's three parts to it. Three dominant centers. Al-Ghazali, rahimahullah, has mentioned 
this many a time, a thousand years before. And if we see that there is the lower part of the brain, which is called the R brain, R reptilian. So meaning, according to the evolutionary scheme of things, that is the reptilian. And this is with regard, this part of the brain controls our physiological needs. Our physiological needs, uh, this is the part, the lower part of the brain, the hard part. Then is the midbrain. And this part is which, which is telling us about the emotions. We are, emotions are centered, and this is uh, the emotive part of the brain. The third part of the brain, the higher part of the brain, the neocortex, and that is where rationality, the cerebral part of the brain, where rationality resides. And remember, these three centers, now these are all part of us. These are all part of us. The R part is also out of us. The mid part, there is no escaping it. We are reptilian. In other words, we have these physiological needs. We have these emotive needs, which we try to give vent to it. There is no escaping it. It's part of our brain. And then the, 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 <coughs> the higher part. <coughs> now, the, like I said again, the, the, main, um, the main focus, really, of our energies and resources is trying to bring these three parts into some sort of balance and equilibrium. And when a person reaches this, then if that person is such that immediately, just by being in that person's company, you understand how stable that person is, how, uh, how balanced that person is. And these are qualities we need to aspire. Not a person who is extremely on this side, neither a person who is extremely on this side. A person who is well balanced, a person who is very proportionate in, a, in his or her approach, this is a good sign of a good, well-balanced, stable person. And people immediately, it's a very likable uh, quality within people. And this is what we try to achieve through what we have been learning for the last nine or so weeks. Now, with regard to the, the types of people, now, these three parts of the brain manifest themselves disproportionately in different people. So some people, now, I don't want you to classify any of your friends according to this classification system. That's not the reason for this. But there are some people that, unfortunately, the, the bottom part of their brains is very dominant in them. And all they can think about... Okay, that, okay that's coming there. Let's go to the, the, the people on the top part of the brain. Now you see which one are you. These are these people who are extremely cerebral. So everything is, is very rational. Everything is very moderate and balanced with regard to it. They are able to suppress the lower two parts, the emotive side and also the desire side, the side which uh, stimulates us to do our, our desires, etc. So those are the cerebral type of people. And don't worry, they do exist, these type of people. It's just a battle in trying to form ourselves within that. Uh, the next part are those people who are called, uh, who, who, whose, whose dominant part is the reptilian center. In other words, what does rules mean to them? Rules are there to be broken. <laughs> That's their motto. <laughs> they have no higher ethics. A uh, person is driving around the road, you can see these three types of people. Right? People who just cut in when they want to cut in and stop wherever they want to stop. People who take other people's parking and park in somebody's driveway. No, no social convention at all. Uh, to walk where they want, to spit where they want. Absolutely, you know, just, oh, this is my life. <laughs> I'll do as I please. Allah, but this is very, very different. Very, very difficult to distinguish this person from this person's lower self. And really, what distinguishes a person, this type of a person, from, from an animal? Huh? How are we different? Animals do exactly the same thing. They, they, they do as they want with whoever they want and nobody questions them. And this person, a human form, has, has no higher function than that person, an, an animal. That's why we even say this person is like a snake. <laughs> this person is like a, Allah forbid, like a dog. Or this person is like this, you know. So, this is a very sad state of, state of affairs and really 
we, we need to look within ourselves and see, really, are we, are we those cultured, refined people? Are we uncultured people, unrefined, uncoordinated, etc.? And then we get a very interesting third party of people. These are these extremely, extremely overly emotional people. Happiness is either very happy or very sad. There's no in between for these type of people. Very emotional people. Either very angry or, <laughs> or very, very sad. Always veering from one extreme to the others like a pendulum. And this obviously also is not good for our overall being. So therefore, these two types of our brain, we need to develop it such that the third type, and Allahu Akbar, you know, fasting. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions about fasting, that the, what, the reason we have prescribed fasting, kutiba alaykum usiyam kama kutiba alayl ladina min qablikum la'allakum tattakum. And it is proven, you know, through uh, science, scientifically, that when a person starts to fast, you know, this is what the idea is about. That how that person's two parts are now brought into self-restraint and subservience to the higher part. That is this, the, cerebral, the cerebral sort of uh, style that a person should really aspire towards. So anyway, uh, these are the three parts that each and every one of us are. And we really need to sometimes take a step back after a 24-hour period of our life and see which part of my my brain was dominating through this day. Am I more the R type? Am I more the emotive type? Or am I more a sort of cerebral sort of person that is able to, to deal with things rationally in a balanced way, in a just and fair way? This is a very interesting uh, experiment that we should really take into consideration. Anyway, are there any questions so far with regard to this? Now. Okay, because I think it's just around the last slide. Okay, uh, we'll just finish this off, inshallah, and we'll, we'll perform a bit. And this is where, and you see, after having, after having heard what I've been saying for the last few minutes, we will understand why in every rakah we are told to read Surah Al Fatiha. Are we not? And in Surah Al Fatiha, there is an ayah that we read. And what is it? Ihdina Sirat al Mustaqeem. And Sirat al Mustaqeem is about this bringing about that equilibrium, bringing all these three parts of our brains into that, that balance, bringing these four faculties that Allah has given us into that moderate and balanced part. And that's why we are asked that each and every salah, five times a day, each and every rakah, to re ask Allah for this dua. The actual part of the Surah Fatiha is actually asking the dua. The first three ayats are just an introduction. But the real, the real the dua we are making is about the Sirat al Mustaqeem, the straight, upright path. And this is amazing, you know, this is, this is such an amazing concept because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us again and again to do it. And you see, like in Mustaqeem, sort of a balanced way. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then, because there's two ways, there are two ways in which a person strays away from Sirat al Mustaqeem. That's why Allah says, غَيْرِ الْمَغْضُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا الضَّالِينَ Al Maghdub alayhim are those who, despite having the knowledge, they don't follow. And Al Dalil are those who are ignorant. And we can also use it this way Al Maghdub alayhim wal الضَّالِينَ those who go either are very deficient, Al Maghdub alayhim. So they have knowledge but are not acting. And walad dali, they are acting but in a very ignorant way. In, a, in the wrong path really. So, al maghdub alayhi walad dali, those who are either extremely deficient or those who are excessive. And the true way which, which we need is obviously as sirat al mustaqim And that is why amazingly Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again and again tells us to read this in our salah. So next time we read it, inshallah, dear brothers and sisters, think of it in this way. How balanced, how moderate, how towards the equilibrium am I going and striving to be? Anyway, with regard to treatment of anger, Imam Ghazali, rahimahullah, again, here, here it comes again, that anger is fine, but remember, the right time, the right place, the right reasons, 
and right intensity. Then it's okay. What are the cures? First cure will remove the anger and the second cure suppresses the anger. Firstly, you must remember that what is the opposite of anger? Forbearance and humility. And think what Allah has told us about hell, about being humble, about not showing anger. And recognize these great virtues and try to inculcate them into our lives. This will stop anger from the very beginning. And to control it, then remember, Nabi of Allah has mentioned, and also that look, that we, 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 we control anger by recognizing that, remember, this thing, this person that is causing this great anger in me, and is really, you know, causing this eruption of emotions within myself, remember, they may have done something, they may have said something, but we must remember that the one behind everything is Allah. And nothing does take place, nothing can take place, nothing will ever take place except that Allah Himself has, has, has uh, allowed it to take place. So that's what Imam Mawlub rahimahullah has said. And that's why we also, another, another cure for anger, and this is a very sure cure. The Mi of Allah has treated this very, very well in the hadith and very explicitly. When a person is angry, Try to read A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem. The reason for this is that the source of anger is normally Shaitan and the actions of Shaitan. So ask Allah, divert your attention from that person and think it to be from Shaitan and ask Allah only to ask to seek protection, uh, to, to seek protection in Allah from Shaitan. Second thing Nabi of Allah has said that if something is angering you and you are standing, then change your posture. Sit down. Sit down. Because if you're standing, it's very easy to run to him and hit him. But if you're sitting, it's a bit more difficult. And if you're sitting, Nabi of Allah says, lie down. Lie down for me. And if you still can't, if you still can't control your anger, go outside in the cold and take a walk. Really. This will help. Move away from the person who's causing your anger. Don't say or do anything in anger. Never. 99% of the time, a person will regret all those actions and that's that thing that person said in anger move away when you have cooled down then talk about it never in fact in 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 in, 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 uh, in fiqh it is mentioned that it is not permissible for a qadi a judge to give any sort of ruling in anger a person is not allowed to give a ruling in anger obviously because anger is an emotion that clouds our other faculty of rationality. A person who is these two, if, if emotion comes through, rationality goes through the window. If rationality comes, emotion is subsumed. These two very seldom can work together. So therefore, Nabi of Allah has mentioned that stay go away from this person who has anger. To the extent that Nabi of Allah has mentioned, uh, the, the ulama have mentioned that even drink, drink some water, <laughs> give him some water. Give him or her some water, because this is very, very, very sad state of affairs. Like I said, a person says something, or a person does something in anger, and the whole life passes in regret and remorse. How many a times this has broken people's houses, broken people's bones, <laughs> and broken so many things that can, sometimes can never, never, ever be repaired. That's why a poet has said very beautifully, in, in Arabic, جراحات السنان له التيام وما ي وما يلتام وما يجرح فيه اللسان. That sometimes, broken, you know, breaking somebody's bone, that you can go to the hospital and to some extent they'll be able to to fix you up. But the arrows that are sent forth from the tongue, there is no sort of medication that can, can, can uh, cause a person to recover from them. In other words, when we say things, they're like arrows, and when those hit the target, a person 20 years old doesn't forget. So remember, my dear friends, I really will plead with you, if there's anything to plead before, then never ever do or say anything in anger. Never. That's why Nabi of Allah said, La tadda, la tadda, la tadda. Do not become angry, do not become angry, do not become angry. 
Okay, this is the last uh, thing. There's a very interesting slide that the Imam has mentioned. He said there are three there are three stages to to the soul according to Islamic model. The first, and he says there are seven seven years of uh, of uh, seven year periods. The first period is known as the appetitive soul, appetite. The primary concern of children in this stage is eating and wanting attention. So this is the first seven years. The second seven years, he says very interestingly, is the age of anger, when kids react strongly to stimuli and are annoyed easily. The third stage, he said then, is the rational stage. I don't know if you'll agree with that. So we're looking at kids at 14 or more. This is when the faculty of reasoning and discernment reach reach their full capacity. That's why the beautiful Ali, Ali radiallahu anhu has mentioned very beautifully, who was known for the wisdom he used to, that used to, uh, the pearls of wisdom that used to come forth from his lips. He mentioned that in the first stage, the first seven years, a person should indulge with their children. This is a time to indulge with them, to play with them. The second seven years, is now the time for training, education, discipline, because this is when it is the height, heightened capacity to absorb. So from 7 to 14, this is a prime years to learn. Then the third stage, Ali radiallahu anhu mentioned, until a person is from about 14 to 21, is the befriending stage. Now it is about relationship that is amicable, kind, and companionship. And this is very, very, very important. Again, through experience, I would say that when our children, you know, inshallah, soon we will become parents also, remember this. How maybe we, we grew up, maybe that wasn't the right way, in the sense that father was like the tiger in the house, the person would not be able to talk, and there was no, no sort of communication, that's not the right way. See, Ali radiallahu is mentioning this, that when they are 14, you know more, do this, do that. No, now it's time to befriend them to be their companions. If you will do this at 21, inshallah, you'll be able to cut the apron strings and let them fly. Hmm? Anyway, this is something very, very beautiful that uh, the Imam had mentioned, and I thought that I'd share this with you. Um, I think uh, that's all for today. Have any questions before we perform our morning? Any time or question? Okay. okay, no questions, inshallah. Thank you.